We continue our summer teaching series, Unsung. This is the second message in this series. And we took the cue for this from Hebrews chapter 11, what is often called the Faith Hall of Fame, Hebrews 11, or the Hall of Faith sometimes. It's a listing of those biblical persons who exemplify what it meant to live by faith. And so we have a recounting of some of the big names in biblical history, Moses and Abraham and so on. But uh, what struck us as we read this chapter and considered what we could do with it was how the chapter concludes. So this is not merely a letter, we don't think. Hebrews is more likely a sermon. And so the preacher, as he gets to the end of his sermon, does what so many preachers do as they run out of time. Watch this. Watch what he does. He says, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about, well, actually, that's not what a preacher does, do they? They keep going. If they don't have time, they just take it. Uh, But he says, I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. And so he begins, he continues the list about more and then begins to describe what some of these people have done, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. And so the discussion continues. But what he's doing, what the preacher's doing, is summing up the long recital of the history of faith by talking about some who may be well-known, like David, but others who aren't so familiar to us. And we see in there Barak and Jephthah, these names that perhaps are less well-known, And the suggestion is, of course, is that these aren't the famous ones, but they are included in the list because they too live by faith. And so this is the beauty of it. It is the significance of these lives, not their fame, that includes them in the recounting of the biblical story of faith. So today I want to talk about Gideon, who was the first in that list. And I wouldn't call him unknown, especially in our time, Most of us have heard of Gideon because of the Gideon's Bible Society. So that society made famous this name by taking this actually rather lesser light in biblical history and elevating him in our popular consciousness. We often have heard of the name Gideon. But I want to pay attention to him and connect him to a line that you see towards the end of this paragraph, whose weakness was turned to strength. I think that's important in the story of Gideon. So that's who we're going to talk about today. Now, I have mentioned this book more than any other I think I've ever mentioned at Westside. I keep track of these things, and I'm sure I've mentioned this book five, six times. I'm reading it for the fourth time. Why would anybody do that? Do I have OCD? What's the problem there? Um, I've read Mere Christianity, I think, six times, seven times, who knows? There's a handful of books like this for me that are just so profound. I go back to them and recapture what it was that got me in the first place. If you try to do that with this book, I hope you succeed. Some some find it harder, but the effort is worth the while. It's an extraordinary book. Annie Dillard was only in her 20s when she decided to explore everything that was going on outside her house in Virginia in this field and this creek that ran through the field to get to know know the neighborhood and write about what she saw. What an extraordinary gift for a young woman in her 20s to write like this. If you or I were passing by Tinker Creek, you wouldn't have seen anything much. Just this nondescript place with a rather muddy creek. But when Annie casts her loving eye on it, it becomes, well, she reveals all the wonders of what is going on there. And she asks questions of life and of God and of herself. She says, the question from agnosticism is, who turned on the lights? The question from faith is, whatever for? So she's looking around the neighborhood. She's writing about birds and animals and insects and plants and all their wonder and strangeness and all the craziness of nature and the extravagance and intricacy of nature. She writes about trees and water and soil. She writes about her environment, the place where she lives. She writes about herself in the middle of all of this. And she keeps turning her thoughts to God. 
Here we are, she says. How did this get here? Who turned on the lights? For her, it's not hard. God. She does have trouble with that second question. (laughs) What is the meaning of all this? We arrived and we're surely here. But what's it all about? It's the question of significance. To what significance am I called? You know, that's a life thought for me. I, I've, I've had that thought about significance ever since I was 21. And I was in my third year of university playing basketball. I was a PE major. So 50 pounds ago, that was me. And uh, mapping out a coaching career. And I came to a real sort of crossroads. And the question for me was, what is significant? And whatever I do in life, it has to be significant. That kept going through my mind at the age of 21. I was grabbed by that singular thought. It became a life thought for me. Whatever I do, it has to mean something. And I think I had a personal call to consider significance. It's a life thought for me. So what is significance? Maybe to understand significance, we have to actually think of what is significant. Before we enter into the condition of significance, we have to ask what things matter. If we know what matters, maybe we can participate. People matter. I go through this evaluative grid all the time. It's something that's always running through my mind. Sorting out the important from the non-important You know, this uh, familiar grid, the urgent but the unimportant. That's something like a phone call often, especially if it comes at 6 o'clock in your house. Almost always, what? Telemarketer. If you run, you might miss something important for the non-important. It was urgent and non-important. You're always sorting this kind of stuff out. Some things that call for immediate attention might be important. They might not be. We have to sort these things out. Some things that don't seem to be calling for our urgent attention might be vital to our lives. We have to pay attention to those. One thing I've learned is looking back, sort of from further along the road, after you get a little perspective, looking back, we often realize that the things that became significant to us only became so afterwards. With a backward glance, we realize what mattered, what seemed to come to mean so much to us after the fact. It was only with perspective that we understand these things. And sometimes these things are small, like a conversation we had or something someone said to us one time. How a a moment of conversation seemed to turn us in a beautiful way. You know, it's those small things, the way we can smile at someone when they walk across the room that can (laughs) mean a lot to them. How we react to people, how we receive people. Our big projects, our work, it surely matters, it does. But when you're on your way to doing your big job, sometimes it's things you do on the way, like the hello or the brief chat, that you can look back on your day and say, that was a significant moment. That mattered. Significance is often quite surprising to us, I think. I would even say it this way. What is truly significant is often unsung. We don't see it until after. So I want to tell the story of Gideon or at least the first part of his story. If we broke down Gideon's story into two parts, we might call, talk about Gideon's calling and then Gideon's war. And for time's sake, I'm just going to really center in on Gideon's calling and only make the briefest reference to his war. We're going to spend some time considering how God calls wh- who Gideon really is, a weak and fearful man, how God calls him into participation of significance, how God pulls him into significance. So let me talk about Gideon's times, because they were tough times. As you would read in the Bible, Judges chapter 6 in the opening words there, we're shown that Israel is in a tough state. It's being overrun by its neighbors, by bordering peoples who seem to feel that they have total access to where Israel lives as a people, and they would come into their land at any time, take what they want, when they wanted. So for Israel, there was no peace, there was no safety, there was no real standing army or king to organize around. There was just hardship and deprivation. So why was Israel so weak at this time? That's the question. The Bible itself, if you read the Judges, will give us the answer. Let me give you the rendering out of the Message Bible, how it reads a very familiar passage. 
God devotion makes a country strong. God avoidance leaves people weak. What you find out in the story of Gideon is the times are tough, but it is also a time of God avoidance. Israel as a people and nation have lost their touch with God. They've lost their faith in God. And in doing so, the Bible suggests they've opened themselves up to every kind of threat and insecurity that comes with that. And in this weak nation, this incredibly uh, weak nation, is a very weak man, Gideon. (laughs) We're going to see he is a weak man in a weak nation. He is representative of his people. And this is the person God is going to call into battle, which is a strange thing to say. Now, let me take this right off the top because this surely comes to mind when we're wrestling with especially Old Testament stories that have to do with war. Because some of our Old Testament scripture stories are difficult to read for some of us as Christian devotion because they involve battles and war. What do you do with that? It's one thing to read them as history to say, well, this is what happened. It's another thing to read these texts for guidance and say, how does this function as the word of God for me? That's, that's the thing that can trip people up at times. I have taught a course in, in the past here at Westside uh, on some of these difficulties. I think it was the God I don't understand, and we dealt with some of the, the biggest questions that confound us, and maybe we should do that again. But let me just say this briefly. The Bible that I read, I read through the lens of Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. I am a Christian. You are too. <laughs> we are a Christian people. We have to look at the whole story through the lens of Christ himself who came and fought the good fight of faith. And how did he fight that faith? How did he fight that fight? He actually took into himself the wounds, into his own body. (laughs) And I think following Jesus means then, and this would be my position, because of the fact that we follow Jesus, we are then called to a peace ethic. We are called to a peaceable way, to nonviolence and to love. But, I want to say this too, and Jesus was real about this, it's still a battle. It's still a battle. So, when I come to read something like Gideon's story, I'm reminded that life is a battle. This life of faith is a battle. If you have the wrong idea about this and think that faith is just cruising down the bow on a Sunday afternoon in a raft, singing Akuna Matata, then you've got the wrong metaphor. And some of us do that. We have this metaphor, this should be a smooth sail. And if any time it gets hard, then something isn't working. No, you were called into the fight. You were called into the battle of your heart and mind and soul. You were called to fight with love for the well-being of your family and your own soul and your nation. This is one of my favorite hymns I sang as a boy. Lead on, O King Eternal. Till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. One of my favorite hymns I sang as a boy. We fight, but we fight differently. Nevertheless, as we come to the story of Gideon today, this is the story of a war meant to stop an invading force that was impoverishing the people. So, Judges chapter 6. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Oprah. No, it didn't belong to Oprah. That belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. That's the invading peoples. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? 
My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, his tribe, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. I'm amazed at several things in this story, and I'm going to recount the amazements that I find here. In the same way that Annie Dillard is amazed as she wanders her neighborhood, I am absolutely dumbstruck by what I see going in this story. First, that God takes the initiative. Second, that God chooses Gideon. And third, that God is patient with Gideon. That's one of the most astounding pieces of the story. So let me walk through this in order. First, God takes the initiative. And I've already said that this is a very tough time for Israel. There's real suffering here. It's a real difficult, extended period of time. And to compound all that, there's real unbelief. There's not only the suffering, but the loss of hopefulness that this will resolve. You know, I, I find it strange, but uh, we find people this, like this in our culture now. People who don't believe in God, but are mad at him. Do you know that kind of thing? Like Richard Dawkins, do you know Richard Dawkins? Doesn't believe in God, but he's mad at him. And it seems to me that this is what's going on in this story somewhat, because when we're going to see in just a moment, as the angel comes to speak to Gideon, as soon as the angel of the Lord speaks a word of comfort and presence, Gideon erupts, doesn't he? Yeah, well, where is God these days? I mean, he's not praying, he's stewing. But this ought to be worth a boatload of encouragement to us. God comes to Gideon and to Israel in its lowest moment. That ought to be a thought that anchors us. In our lowest moments, God can show up. Absolutely can. Abraham Heschel wrote a book, God in Search of Man, and I love that title. What a title, God in Search of Man. Heschel says that commonly conceived, religion is the search for God. That's how we think of religion. Or we might refer to ourselves as seekers. We're on a search for him, this elusive God. Where is he hiding? Where's Waldo? Where's God? Right? Where is he? But what we see in the Bible, in story after story after story, God himself takes the initiative. That's what we see. Track it. See if you can find the same pattern. God comes looking for us. God comes to speak to persons, and to call them into life. And the Bible is filled with these surprising moments. We can see it over and over again. And we realize then what we're dealing with here. The Bible doesn't speak of God as a cosmic entity or force, like a law or a principle. God is not karma. God is not gravity. God is not a philosophical idea. God is a living being who is free to intercept us in any time, in any way he wants to. Don't think about God as an enduring principle. That's beneath God and beneath you. God is a living being who interacts and communicates. Does he speak? I would just say, of course he speaks. Of course he does. And he can intercept us. And he gets involved with us. And he shows up. In fact, that might be the deepest thing we know from our Christian faith, that in Jesus, God took upon himself human flesh and became one with us. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. You know, I've always been resistant to this kind of sermon or Christian thinking that starts this way. We should. We should do this or that. Now, I understand we should believe more, we should pray more, we should give more, we should behave better. I agree with all that. I should. But I think it starts at the wrong place when we start with, I should. There's a lot of things I should do and you should do. So what's the problem here? The problem is that we can't. Or we're willful and we say, no, I won't. I think Christian hope begins in another place. It doesn't begin with, we should. It begins with, God has spoken to us and come to us and called us into his life. He is empowering us to love and to serve. (laughs) That makes a different standing point 
and starting point and makes all the difference. So if you are hopeless or helpless or weak or fearful or sinful or doubtful or slothful or whatever your state is, here is your hope. The living God speaks a word of orientation to us to say, mighty warrior, I am with you and I am sending you. It amazes me that God takes the initiative. It amazes me. So the second thing I'm amazed at is that God chooses Gideon of all people. So think about what's going on here in this story. Gideon is afraid. That's what's going on. He's hiding. He is threshing his wheat in a wine press. So why is he doing that? He's trying to keep what little he has away from the Midianites, the raiders who would come through and say, what have you got there, Gideon? And there goes supper, right? He's hiding. He's afraid. So you've got to feel this scene. Feel it. Here's a man just trying to survive. He's just trying to hold on to the little bit of life that he has. He's fearful. He's afraid. And to this person, God says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, that's absurd. You know what comedy is. Comedy deals in the absurd, right? That's why we laugh at Jim Carrey because he's absurd, right? And this is a comedic moment in the scripture. Comedy is evident here. God saying to Gideon, mighty warrior, we are meant to write in the margins of our Bible, ha! That's a laugh. It's also amazing. Not only is Gideon afraid, he's filled with doubt and complaint. So look what's going on here. Gideon interrupts, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us? So why wouldn't God look for a more positive attitude? Why is Gideon in the hall of faith? These things amaze us. God answers, Gideon, go. I am sending you. But Gideon keeps up the protest. This is what's going on. Have you seen where I come from? My family is the weakest of my whole tribe. (laughs) No college graduates. Nobody with a good job. Nobody owns anything. We're a sorry lot. And me, Gideon, I'm the weakest of my whole family. Now, how is that for self-confidence? Do you know anything about personal inadequacy? Do you know anything about that? I do. I know what that feels like. And here is a moment we can identify with. And God says, mighty warrior, <laughs> here's who you are. I am sending you. I am with you. Remarkable. The third thing that amazes me in this story is how patient God is with Gideon. And this maybe tops off all of our amazements. Gideon is going to go through now what we might call inner wrestling. So before he enters the battle, he's going to go through the battle of his own heart, the battle of his own mind and soul. Gideon replies to God, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. It's an amazing thing, God waiting on us. God, give me a sign. If it's really you, may the seventh car that comes my way be a red Prius. Is that faith? (laughs) Is that hesitation or doubt? What is that? Gideon's inner wrestle is this. Can he really trust God? Perhaps the real issue is that we project on God our own fickleness. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe we put on God the nature and shape of our own soul. Two boys decided to make a trade. One said, I will give you all my marbles for all your baseball cards. Deal? Deal. So they each ran home to get their trade And the boy who thought of the deal got home and said, he doesn't know how many marbles I have. If I hold some back, he'll never know. 
That night, after the trade was done, the boy lay awake all night, wondering if his friend had given him all his cards. We project onto God who we are. We think he might be as fickle as we are. It's an absurd thing to say to the most trustworthy, most loving, most powerful being in the universe, I can't trust you. Actually, I said that wrong. God is not the most trustworthy being in the universe, for the universe is in him. Our mind boggles to think that God stands out of his created order, loving all things into being. He is the original big bang of love who said, let it be. Making all things. He holds the universe within himself. So great is his immensity and his power and his knowledge. And not only his immensity, but his love and his truthfulness. And Jeremiah said it this way, great is your faithfulness. Whatever you've said, you will do. And for this little finite creature, Gideon, hiding in a wine press, threshing a small amount of grain, the weakest member of a weak family, <laughs> afraid, filled with confusion, filled with doubts and skepticism, who erupts in complaint the moment God speaks to him. For that one, the almighty, all-powerful, all-loving, all-faithful God submits himself to wait. That amazes me. I'm amazed that God waits on Gideon. God waits for you and me. You know, the bottom line in all of this is that Gideon still is not convinced. This is a long story of waffling. Maybe that speaks to us if we've gone through a long season of this. He's still not fully convinced he can trust God. So we come now to a famous part in the Gideon story, which is often called the flea story. Sometimes people talk about putting out a fleece before God as if this is a way to ask for guidance. I don't think that's what's going on here. So let me read it for you. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor, and if there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand as you have said. A little test for God. And that is what happened. Gideon arose early the next day. He squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew a bowl full of water. Is that enough for Gideon? No, it's not. Then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece, but this time make the fleece dry and let the ground all around it be covered with dew. That night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Now, some see this as a model for guidance, but I think we should see this as Gideon's continual hesitation. So why is he included in the hall of faith? <laughs> why might we include him as an unsung hero with the lesser known heroes? Well, you're going to have to read Judges chapter 7 to find out. <laughs> What? You're going to leave us there? Yep. This is how we get you to read your Bible. <laughs> we pull you up to a point and stop. You're going to have to see what happens. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Gideon ultimately says yes to God. He waffles for a while, but he doesn't waffle endlessly. But in keeping with this general theme of weakness in his life, God is going to lead him into battle in a weakened condition. It won't be through numbers that he will win. It will be through the very agency of God that Gideon will bring peace to his people. So he does belong here in the hall of faith as a weak man. You know, I look at the cast of characters in Hebrew 11 and I realize there are people just like us. That's what's happening here. People with flaws, people with doubts, people with complaints and weaknesses, 
people who don't always get it right, like you and I. And these are the kind of people that God calls to believe and to live by faith. And Jesus said this, didn't he? If you have faith like a mustard seed. (laughs) Is there a small place in your heart, inside your waffling heart, is there something small there that you can give and trust to the almighty, all-faithful God? That's the question. Gideon's story is very poignant for me. Gideon, whose weakness was turned to strength. Now watch your screens for something extraordinary. Whoa, that was amazing. They didn't have that in Bible times. Whose weakness was turned to strength. Let me end with this. When I last spoke a couple of weeks ago, I I just returned from an extended time away. I was studying at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, in spiritual direction, which is a form of pastoral ministry, pastoral counsel. And my days were filled with study, but also prayer. And it was a very rich time. Study in the morning, library in the afternoon, and then I'd have these evenings of prayer and reading. And I was away from my usual demands, and so I really slept well. I had my own pillow with me, which helps. But that wasn't it. It was just being in a different place and being present to the God of my life in some way. And one morning I woke up from a dream. I don't always dream that much, but I I began to dream again, which is interesting. I woke up from a dream and almost immediately I said to myself, I have changed. I'm not as bold as I once was. Why Why have I become so hesitant? And this is what I was dreaming about. I was dreaming about a moment in my life when I took this rather bold trip across Canada. I was 22. I was out of university. I was back in my old hometown of Kelowna. And I wanted to go on this mission trip to South Africa. I had this real sense of calling to ministry, and I wanted to be part of a mission trip I was invited to be part of. But I couldn't get my money together in Kelowna. Employment was difficult. So I said, I'm going home to Toronto. But here's the problem. I had my little Honda Civic in 1977. Those cars were tiny. And so it was like wearing a coat for me, this little car. Four speeds. It wouldn't go very fast. And I had $40. That's not enough to make it across Canada. And I said, I'm going to start driving and find a job somewhere along the way. That's what I said. So I started off, and rather crazily, I drove until I was on my last tank of gas, which was around somewhere around Swift Current, Saskatchewan, and I drove into town, and I went into the manpower office, which in those days was the employment office, and I found a job on a farm about 50K outside of town in a place called Hodgeville, Saskatchewan. And so I went out there, met the family, and here's where you'll sleep, and you can work, and we'll pay you minimum wage, and we work 16 hours a day, so you're going to milk the cows twice a day, and you're going to drive the truck hauling the grain for the harvest, and you can eat food with us. So that was some good eating on that farm. Good days, long, beautiful days. And on the farm was a mother and a father, and their two grown sons, and one of the sons was married. And I'd been there for about four or five days when the wife of this son said to me, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she said, I've been praying that God would send someone along to talk to my husband, Grant. Whoa. I was just trying to get home. (laughs) I just wandered into significance. I was just trying to get some money to get home. And so for the second week I was there, I was very aware of Grant. Grant was one of those mysterious, silent types who didn't say much. Think of your typical Saskatchewan farmer. Solid, deep, quiet. I remember talking to him and being very present to him. I think I helped him, but I remember praying for him a lot, knowing that I was in the presence of something significant because somebody had been praying, and here's where I end up. And I worked with that family for two weeks and got enough money and made it home. 
But it seems to me this is how significance comes. We stumble into it. And you know why? Because we're not the initiators. God is the initiator of significance. God is intent on the significance of our lives. God interrupts us and says, take notice of this or that. It's important. If you're going to live by faith, you're going to have to be a noticer of what matters. And that was 36 years ago, and I was recalling this when I woke up from that dream at Creighton University. I just woke up from the dream saying, that was a crazy idea. Try to drive across Canada without enough money and stop and work on a farm for a few weeks. That was crazy. Crazy fun. (laughs) And I woke up saying to myself, where did that bold spirit go? You know, I, I lived like that in my 20s and 30s. I planted a couple of churches and went on mission. Where did that boldness go? As I contemplated the Gideon story this week, I knew again that Hesitation and weakness can be overcome. We look for your initiatives, Lord. We look for your initiatives. Let's pray. Father of life, Lord of our stories, We know that we should be different than we are, but we're weak. But would you come to us? Would you surprise us with your presence or with an interruption or with a conversation where we know we've touched on significance? Call us we pray, into the adventure of life, into bold and courageous actions, whatever that means for us in the particularities of our life. Whatever it means for us. For some of us, that means opening our hands to give or to serve or to be involved somehow. For some of us, it's going to be courageous to let go or forgive or move along. You have a way of fingering what courage means for us. If we have been endlessly waffling, Lord, be patient with us. Help us to finally say yes. Gideon did, finally, and so can we. No matter how weak we are, Lord, we pray that you would continue your insistence on living lives of significance. Today, as we see the unsung heroes around us, help us to see them and thank them. There are people of faith around us, and we appreciate that. So today, we pray that you'd be with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. Listen, thank you for being such an attentive audience. Let's stand together. It's always a joy to spend time with you. So I send you with this. Go and learn the greatness and goodness and faithfulness of our God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Have a wonderful summer Sunday afternoon. We'll see you next week. God bless.